Okay, so we are moving into uh, the black hole discussions uh, for today. So I'm sure they are going to be uh, entertaining for sure. So let me remind people um, uh, also that uh, if you have more questions for, for Jeff, maybe the average session where we'll, I'm sure we'll discuss lots of SYK would be a good point to follow up on some questions that we did not have time to, to, to post. So let me say a few words that will not count towards the initial uh, 20 minutes of uh, introduction of uh, Neta and Rob. So the idea of these discussions, we have 20 minutes and uh, these 20 minutes are totally up to Neta and Rob. So for example, they are even going to do something a bit different. They are going to do a, small, a bigger block in the beginning, like 15 minutes and use the remaining part of say their last five minutes, a little bit later, uh, later into the discussion. So. Rob and Neta, please just let me know when you want to use those uh, last five minutes or so. And also, uh, in the 30 minutes, please uh, turn on your camera in the 30 minutes of informal discussion if you want to participate. Raise your hand if you want to ask a question. I'll call upon people mostly by uh, order, but also giving slight priority to people that uh, have not asked questions yet. And if you want to ask a question about something that is being discussed right now, just please uh, wave your hand. So, uh, and this, I suspect it's going to be particularly important in this session. So some people told me, I know how to clap. I know how to raise my hand, uh, but I don't know how to wave, but it's easy. If you raise your hand, then you just move your hand a little bit and then you'll be waving. So just turn your camera on and we'll be able to, to see you very well. So I guess that's it. Uh, I'll pass it over to Rob and um, Aneta. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Ned and I here to, uh, lead the discussion, but uh, first we'd like to thank Pedro, Horacio, Nathan, and all the rest of the organizers for doing such a wonderful job bringing us all together for Strings 2021. Um, I'm gonna be doing a bit of introduction just to set the stage. Here we see the Penrose diagram for an evaporating black hole. Of course, the marvelous discovery of Hawking's was that when we take into account quantum fluctuations, the black holes actually leak or emit uh, radiation. Um, <clears throat> of course, the, the contradiction or the puzzle arises when we take into account uh, the collapse being formed not by a proper star, but by a pure state. So we might have some quantum excitations that are focused to produce a, a gravitational collapse, form a black hole, and all of the subsequent evolution. However, when we look at the mixed state, eventually the black hole has disappeared and we're just left with this cloud of uh, radiation on a late time slice, which as I said, is in a mixed state. It appears to be thermal radiation. Of course, that's in contradiction with the basic tenet of uh, quantum theory, namely unitary time evolution. If we start with a pure state, we should end with a pure state. Of course, the origin of the mixed state can be understood in terms of a pair production process, as uh, Samir mentioned on Tuesday. If we look at the vacuum state near the horizon, what we see are there entangled pairs across the horizon. One of those quanta outside the horizon can escape to infinity and become part of the Hawking cloud. The other pair or the other quanta in the pair is trapped behind the horizon and never escapes. Now, Don Page uh, took this into consideration in thinking about what a unitary time evolution should look like. He noted that if we think about the entanglement entropy of the uh, radiation, it starts with zero when we have no radiation, but as the black hole emits more and more, uh, the, rate, the entropy simply grows until the black hole disappears here. And at that point, the entropy is capped off. However, if, this, if the origin is really this entanglement with the degrees of freedom behind the horizon, then the entropy of the radiation should be bounded by the entropy of the entangling system, namely the degrees of freedom behind the horizon. Those in turn should be uh, bounded by the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy or the area over 4G of the horizon. And then this is shrinking as the process proceeds as shown in the, the, by the green line. And so what Don realized or argued for was that in a unitary time evolution, 
the proper description of the entropy should be a rising part, but then in the latter uh, part of the evolution that should be decreasing and there should be some kind of hidden correlations between the early radiation and the late radiation. Now the real, or one of the real puzzles is that this turnaround happens around the middle of the process. And so this is when the black hole is still microscopic and we feel we understand or should understand all of the physics in play. Now the exciting progress came about just over two years ago now when these two papers showed us that in fact we can calculate for certain models the page curve in a controlled manner. Of course, there's been a lot of activity since then building on this work, and I hope to hear from uh, many of you uh, in the discussion section. But to bring to the fore one of the key ingredients in this new work, it's the idea of the quantum extremal surface as was featured in Jeff's uh, talk yesterday. Ruin Takinagi taught us in thinking about holographic entanglement entropy to think about extremal surfaces, namely, surfaces that extremize the Bekenstein Hawking formula over a certain homology class. However, these authors here, including Netta and Aaron in particular, taught us to think about the generalized entropy where we don't just have this geometric boundary term, but we also take into account the entanglement entropy of the quantum fields on a partial Cauchy slice extending out from that surface to the boundary. Now, when there are a lot of calculations, but when they're all combined together, uh, they can be summarized by this island rule that was as dubbed by our friends here in Princeton. And the idea is that the entang proper calculation of the entanglement entropy is given by an extremization of the generalized entropy where we're considering not just the radiation region or the Hawking quanta, but we're also including geometric regions near the black hole um, there are the so-called islands. And those islands contribute both to the quantum part and to the geometric part here. And so there's a minima here because what comes into play is a competition of saddles for this formula here. At the early times, the island, as Jeff says, is the empty set. There is no island. We're simply doing Hawking's calculation but that at late times, a large amount of entanglement builds between the radiation and the region behind the horizon, and a new saddle appears with a non-trivial island, and that describes this falling entropy here. And this, as I said, competition of saddles is something we're used to in thinking about holographic entanglement entropy, and it's exactly, in fact, that competition of saddles in certain holographic models that we may hear about later. But it's also been just, this formula has been justified by new calculations involving replica wormholes as Steve Schenker uh, reviewed in, in his talk on Tuesday. And so at that point, I'm going to hand it off to Netta uh, for the second half of our discussion or our presentation. Thank you. Let's thank Rob while Netta sets up uh, the screen share. All right, can you all see this? Yeah, please go ahead. Great. Uh, so again, I want, I want to also thank the organizers um, and also thank Rob for the first half of, uh, of this. So uh, as Rob has already reviewed, uh, Entropy has done a lot for us on the black hole information front. And so here's a, a very brief status check. Uh, we can put a check mark on deriving the page curve, mm -hmm. but we can't really put a check mark on uh, resolving the information paradox. So that's something that we have uh, yet to do. And the, the purpose of, uh, of this part of the discussion is of the um, prelude to the discussion is to uh, ask the question or to raise up the point that potentially entropy is, uh, is not enough. This of course is uh, brought up by, uh, by Lenny Suskin in a somewhat different context of the growing volume of the wormhole in the thermophile double where he proposed together with others that this is dual to the complexity. And so we could ask at this point, and uh, we would not be the first one to do so, what is the role of complexity in the information paradox? And really this was uh, discussed already uh, long before these recent developments of the last couple of years, computing the page curve by Harlow and Hayden, who pointed out that decoding the Hawking radiation is exponentially complex. And this was followed by uh, Aronson and more recently clarified and developed further by Kim Tang and Presco. 
So let me make a few statements that uh, hopefully will not be too controversial. I would say that any full resolution of the information paradox has to explain how to compute the page curve from first principles, from the microscopics, and also has to explain subsequently um, what Hawking missed. And given Harlow and Hayden's results about exponential complexity and uh, decoding the Hawking radiation, it would seem that exponential complexity is a critical aspect of the information problem. And uh, the ability to access exponentially complex operators, the ability to compute this, appears to be rather crucial in deriving unitarity, since it is part of decoding the Hawking radiation. Now, one lesson we can learn from the past couple of years is that the geometric picture of entropy has been incredibly valuable in making progress on the information paradox. And so we can ask, uh, can it help us also with understanding the uh, complexity? Is there a geometric picture that can help us understand it better? And so in particular, in the context of this reconstruction complexity, there's a very, uh, very nice paper, so-called the Python's Lunch by Brown, Garibian, Pennington, and Susskind. This was referenced in Jeff's talk, so I'll only talk about it briefly. And it's the, it's the statement that if you're working with this geometric picture, the geometric avatar of uh, exponential complexity of reconstruction is a non-minimal quantum extremal surface. So here we have a sort of a toy model of um, a tensor network that is meant to represent a Cauchy slice of the bulk. We have some left and right two boundaries here. And uh, the main takeaway I want to have from this picture is that there are two quantum extremal surfaces here, quantum extremal surfaces here that correspond to two constrictions of the tensor network. And here the, we have, uh, so here we have just, this is the minimal one, and we have tensors that have a smaller number of legs here and a larger number of legs here, which correspond to isometries. And then we have these funny ones that do the opposite. And these are, it's very important. Uh, these are post-election, which involve conditioning on an outcome, which is why, uh, which is one of the sources of uh, exponential complexity here. So this, this bulge here in the tensor network is uh, geometrized in, in this way, in this, uh, on a Cauchy slice of the bulk, we have some minimal quantum extremal surface and a non-minimal quantum extremal surface here. And there, that's the reason this is called the Python's lunch, this bulge here in the middle. And similarly, over here, this is just a, a conformal diagram of the same phenomenon. So the proposal that complexity is proportional to the difference in generalized entropies between the large one here and the smaller one here. And uh, as Jeff mentioned in his talk, there, there's, you can also argue that non-minimal quantum extremal surfaces are in some sense the only source of exponential complexity in the dictionary, of exponential reconstruction complexity. Now this is uh, this is very exciting uh, in the sense that this uh, consistent there's a consistency here. So the gravitational path integral calculations tell us that the subdominant saddle uh, corresponds to doing the wrong calculation, the Hawking calculation that gives you a uh, loss of information. And here we see in this geometrization of complexity that if you use the non-minimal quantum extremal surface, you've lost access to the, the lunch region. You've lost access to the operators that would be exponentially hard to reconstruct and, uh, and corresponding in particular to the Hawking radiation. So um, I want to say just one more word about typical states and code subspace, code subspaces. So uh, just a comment on you know, which quantum ex extremal surface is minimal or non-minimal, where the quantum extremal surface is that determines what you can reconstruct does depend on the choice of code subspace. And so when the code subspace is very large, less of the bulk is going to admit a state independent reconstruction. So we may end up having access to progressively less of the lunch if we want to do state independent reconstruction. So one question that I'd like to bring up for discussion is um, what about very large code subspaces? We're talking about typical states. What about typical state arguments for uh, firewalls? So here is the, uh, the uh, just a few questions to for the discussion. We're going to go counterclockwise on these. So starting with uh, with this one, and we're just going to move along and hope we get to discussing all of them in the time that we have left. So we'll begin with uh, why is semi-classical gravity and specifically the gravitational path integral so smart? And we're going to begin with a couple of comments from uh, from Chris Akers. So uh, Chris, if you can unmute yourself. Hey everybody. Um, okay, yeah. So what I want to tell you about is um, 
this this new perspective so, or this different perspective. So um, we want to understand the quantum extremal surface formula. Uh, I don't have to motivate why that's important for the information loss paradox. Um, but so far, you know, the, the usual derivations of it come from the Euclidean gravitational path integral, um, which are great, but they don't explain everything. So for example, you can use the Euclidean path integral to compute the Bekenstein Hawking entropy that S equals A over four G, um, but it won't tell you uh, what the microstates are that you're counting. Hence, it would be nice to have a Hilbert space understanding of quantum extremal surfaces in which the microstates are manifest. Um, one approach would be to understand the quantum extremal surface formula as a consequence of the fact that the bulk is embedded into the boundary, like a quantum error correcting code. So this is something that was taught to us, uh, you know, by Almeri, Dong, and Harlow for independent reasons. Um, so applied to this problem, we've actually seen some progress. So this this idea was pursued first by Harlow in 2016 in his paper Ryu Takinagi from Quantum Error Correction, and then it's now being generalized to quantum minimal surfaces. So this is a special case of quantum extremal surfaces where you're applying it to uh, static or time symmetric states. Um, and this, this will be uh, explained in forthcoming work, probably in about a month, um, by Jeff Pennington and myself. So some immediate lessons that you get from this. For example, you learn that the area term in the quantum extremal surface formula can be interpreted as the extra entanglement that is needed to encode the bulk into the boundary. And also that this minimality condition, the fact that you're picking like the minimal quantum extremal surface, comes from a certain limited capacity for encoding the bulk into the boundary. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Chris. So I think with that, we'll open the, uh, the discussion on this, uh, on this topic, and then we will move on to um, the next topic after that. So if you, if you see that if there's a comment you wanna make that's more relevant from one of the other questions, then uh, maybe hold on to it until we get there. So oh, perfect. And, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And you did very well on time. So you did reserve time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and let's Thank go. you. So. Can, can I suggest we go to Daniel to make some of comments? Hi, so, yeah, I just wanted to say something simple, actually, related to the question that Netta just brought up. Um, so so in, in quantum field theory, um, the Euclidean path integral is very straightforwardly related to a trace, a, a thermal trace in Hilbert space. Um, you know, you just, uh, you take the quantum field theory partition function on S1 times some manifold and you insert complete sets of states going around the S1 and you just very clearly get a trace. Um, but in quantum gravity and the way we usually do the Euclidean quantum gravity path integral, this is not true because the thermal circle um, is allowed to contract, you know, say for example, at the tip of the Schwarzschild cigar uh, and that, that destroys um, the trace interpretation or at least the manifest trace interpretation of the Euclidean gravity path integral. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, you know, in special cases mm -hmm. where gravity is normalizable, like, you know, pure Einstein gravity in two plus one dimensions or pure JT. Um, so since it's normalizable, you can just do canonical quantization uh, and, you, and you get a theory where that Euclidean path integral indeed does not have a statistical, it, the, the, that Euclidean path integral does not have a statistical interpretation in terms of the canonically quantized Hilbert space. Um, on the other hand, in holographic theories, which maybe most of us think are kind of the only theories in sufficiently high numbers of dimensions, uh, then the Euclidean path integral, what it seems to know is it knows about the trace in the holographic dual, right? So it doesn't, you know, if the bulk theory makes sense by itself, then the Euclidean gravity path integral is just kind of a distraction. <laughs> but if the bulk theory needs some holographic completion, uh, then you know, Euclidean gravity comes into its own uh, and seems to really know that, um, you know, know about the microstates in the holographic dual theory, even though, you know, from the bulk point of view, it doesn't look like it should. Um, and it's kind of maybe a little bit puzzling, why should that be true? And so, so re recently, Edgar and I had a paper about this, uh, where we essentially argued that one way to think about it is that you, the Euclidean path integral is kind of restoring, is, is the sort of minimal modification of the bulk theory that will restore modular invariance, which in holographic theory is a necessary property of the theory. Um, thanks. Okay. 
I don't know if Chris wants to respond to that at all or make any comment. I, I'm gonna... I agree with that. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> okay, I'm uh, Raju uh, Suvret. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to say a little bit about uh, Rob's initial introduction. So it doesn't quite fit, I think, exactly into Netta's framework. Uh, but I think there's something which, which I think we should bring up and perhaps discuss. And that is that, you know, when the information paradox was first formulated by Hawking, uh, you know, the main assumption he had was this idea of the principle of ignorance, uh, which is that, you know, the Hilbert space factorizes into inside and outside. You can trace over the inside. And so you get a mixed state outside. Uh, now, we know that this is incorrect, but when people first started to talk about the page curve, I think the fact that the Hilbert space doesn't factorize was not appreciated. And so the expectation that you should get a page curve is in fact based on the same assumption <clears throat> that you should have a factorized Hilbert space into inside and outside. Uh, and I think now we understand this assumption is incorrect, but you know, because for historical reasons, we expected a page curve, we now invent, or you know, we've now come up with many models where the page curve is the right answer. Uh, but I think we should, you know, uh, we should, there, there should be, we should, uh, uh, I think, appreciate that uh, some of these models are very unlike ordinary gravity. You know, when you talk about the Euclidean path integral, there are points where, you know, gravity switches off at some point. And in higher dimensions, in every case where this calculation has been done, the theory of gravity is actually massive. And so you have, there's a factorization problem. And these are all pathologies of these models that come about because, you know, we're trying to impose uh, the page curve, which is not naturally a gravitational question. Uh, so I think there's another way of looking at things, which is that if one recognizes that the Hilbert space does in fact rise uh, and thinks about how quantum information is localized in gravity, uh, then you know, one would come to the conclusion that the information is always outside. And that wouldn't give us a page curve, uh, but you know, maybe the page curve is not the thing that uh, we should discuss because it leads to all of these other complications in the models uh, where it does emerge. Uh, thank you, Suvret. Um, I, I, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on that or... I don't see anyone waving. Ah, I okay. see Andy. Andy's waving. Andy's waving. Andy's waving. <laughs> okay, Andy, go for it. I, I think there is an unambiguous definition of the page curve in asymptotically flat spaces. It's, it's, it's more subtle in anti-de-sitter spaces, but you just have a detector up at infinity and they, um, they measure a quantum state. And we, if unitarity is restored, then if unitar unitarity holds, then the, the complete quantum state on scribe plus is a pure state. And we measure the state up to some value of retarded time. We always keep very far from the black hole. So we never ask inside or outside. We never need to make that distinction. We just are measuring the radiation that crosses the detector. And in general, that's a, a of course, we have to repeat the measurement many times as usual in quantum mechanics, but that's either, you know, that's some kind of mixed state and we can just compute its trace row log row. But I think this is precisely the setup that we examined uh, last year. And I think if you look at, not even at future at Scribe Plus, uh, you know, there is a constraint. And so the Hilbert space, you know, doesn't factorize. And in fact, all the information at Scribe Plus is already available near its past boundary. Now you could ask for a page curve by you know, looking only at news operators and throwing out the Bondi mass uh, from the algebra. Uh, but then in fact, it depends on you know, how much entanglement there is between soft modes well, and hard I'm going to agree with you that- all I, I, I'm going to agree with yes. you that soft modes are important, but in, in the conventional discussion, those are ignored. Uh, and if we're you know, it, ignoring those, we just have a bunch of hard gravitons at the Hawking temperature coming out or whatever else is coming out and we just compute their, uh, their, their No, I think you're also ignoring the constrained degrees of freedom in the metric. If you keep into track, keep track, not just of the news. Yes, operators, I, but am also ignoring the all that. I am ignoring all right. that. And I think that's, right, but that's important, but all of that is assumed in all in basically every discussion of it. But, but I, okay, but I think I think if you keep track of the Bondi mass, then I think information, you know, you keep track of the full fine grain entropy and scry plus, then information is already available in its past boundary. It doesn't em emerge according to a page curve. You know, one can look at restricted algebras when it does by throwing out some of these things by hand. But measurements yeah. at scry plus don't require you to say what is or isn't inside the black hole. That's correct, that's correct. But I'm, I'm just saying you look at the full algebra at the past boundary of scry plus. So including the ADM mass and the news operators, and then you know the entropy is already a constant. 
I mean, so, so that's what we showed last year in this paper with Alok, which I think we yeah, also But if you want to bit. compute, if you can't want to compute something as a function of time, you can't just look at the past boundary. You have to look at something that, you have to look at a cut of scryed as a function of time. Okay, so you could look at a cut of scry as a function of time, but if you looked at a cut that extended up to the past boundary, you know, that's an observer who's collecting all the radiation from the start then that observer just always has, has the information. I mean, you could look at a cut that moves up, so you kind of forget things, and, you, and then you might get a page curve. But you know, if you ask, is the information always outside, then I think the answer is probably it is. You know, you can, you can, there are various ways of discarding information to get a page curve. Uh, Yasunari was not yeah, exactly let's... waving, but nodding, so I, I interpret that as... <laughs> No, 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 it's, it's not uh, uh, really uh, uh, on that, that issue. But uh, thanks, Rob and Nero, for the uh, starting discussion, which is beautiful. And, and I think it's a great start. I just I want to make uh, some comments. Um, th this island and uh, like Python, it's a beautiful progress, which I really, really enjoyed. And those are based on like a global uh, space time, you start from uh, like equal time surface, which path through interior as well. And there you can see uh, islands and so on, QES and so on. But I think it's equally important to start from kind of a unitary, manifestly unitary description, which is essentially boundary description, or if you want to say short shield time slice de description. And on that description, if you throw in an object, even classically, it doesn't enter horizon, right? It just stuck, keeps stacking on this. And then if you turn on the Hawking radiation, of course, it's not that surprising that things are unitary because it's like a usual surface because of central dogma uh, people are, are, are saying. And then the problem is boiled down. If you start from that, the problem is boiled down to what's the interior of the black hole uh, means. In other words, what's analytic extension means in quantum gravity. And even for that, if you throw in some uh, high energy object, object, object whose energy is much higher than the Hawking temperature, or which is much smaller than uh, uh, horizon, and then you, you can, or I can show that explicitly the existence of operators whose algebras are exactly the interior operators, and you can construct a local Hamiltonian describing the motion of these guys, inside uh, the black hole. If you focus only on these objects, a uh, very, very small cold subspace in, in a uh, uh, mm -hmm. point of view, and those are state dependent operators, but still applies to exponentially many microstates. So E3, C times S Bekenstein Hawking with a C smaller than one, okay? So uh, very stable operators. So, so the, my point is that we uh, need to be clear, I think, on what we want to know, namely, to claim that the problem is solved. Because at this level of, of story or some, 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 something, I, we, we can show it. And the people still saying that the black hole information problem is not solved. So in what sense, when we are convinced that the problem is solved, that we no longer be saying that the black hole has a problem. And for me, so this is the last thing. For me, starting from this unitary picture, and the solution is, um, why this particular operator state dependent, which is associated with the falling object, is the right operators to use to describe semi-classical physics of the interior of the black hole. And that's to do with what is a classical description, namely uh, 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 quantum measurement. It's, it's a problem of the measurement in quantum system with a finite degrees of freedom because black hole is a finite degrees of freedom. What kind of the operator is right observable in finite system, so it's same as a cosmology. And then I think it's a clearly, completely uh, 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 black hole information is solved. And that's not the one we are interested in the other way, starting from global picture, like Ireland. And then the question, equivalent question, but in the other way, is that what's the wormhole, what's the ensemble, what's the quantum state, if you want. So these are, of course, starting point is different, so question is different, but we want to be clear what we want to know and when we claim that the problem is solved. Otherwise it's like, yeah, that's, that's the only thing I just wanted to say. So who would like to address this? Uh, Daniel? 
I wanted to discuss a little bit more with what Suvrat said, because I think it's worth discussing a, a little more. Um, so if you think about a small black hole in ADS CFT, so I believe that the, the analog of, there's an analog of what Suvrat said in, in, in ADS, which is if you make a small black hole and then you <coughs> load evaporate, if you compute the entropy of all the operators in the dual CFT as a function of time, uh, you get a flat page curve because uh, the dual CFT knows everything, both the radiation and the black hole. Uh, and so I think similarly in flat space, it's true that if you think, you know, we don't know what it is, but we can imagine there's some microscopic holographic description of flat space, you know, living probably at null infinity or something like that. And if you include all the operators, you know, and you allow to, yourself to make arbitrary measurements, then the statement of holography, of course, is that you can learn everything. So there's no natural split into the stuff that's in the radiation and the stuff that's still in the black hole, um, you know, at the level of computing the entropy of all the operators. So it's only when you restrict yourself in some way, you don't let yourself measure everything uh, in a holographic theory that you can hope to learn about some subregion in the bulk. Um, and I think that, I mean, that's clearly true in ADS and I, uh, flat space, I understand much less well, but I guess it's true there too. And I ask you, Daniel, then in some sense, I'm doing an experiment when I'm building these models of coupling a bath to the uh, ADS space. What's the extra coupling or what's the extra experiment I have to do to get uh, the information out? Mm -hmm. Wait, so you mean you mean like in the in the in the in the calc calculations of of Pennington and Almeri Engelhard yeah, and Merrill yeah. and Maxfield? Yeah. So I mean, so there you're there you're literally. I mean, there the holographic theory is not everything, right? Because you've coupled it to some external system. So the stuff you know, information really is getting out. But but that's not how. Right, but in, I can think of that situation. as being the experimenter, and I'm probing my system, the CFT or the defect. Right. And I'm pulling information out. And I know Suvrat wants to say something, but I don't know if Daniel wants to. Well, I don't, I don't I, see a I, contradiction I wanna, I wanna with what you're saying, Rob. I mean, okay. the, the, to, to do the page curve, you have to split the system into the part that's still got the black hole and the part that's got the radiation. And if you your rules for computing the page curve don't involve that split, then I suspect you're going to get a flat page curve. And in flat space, there's a very natural way to do that split. You take a cut of scry, all of scry has a pure state. You have a, take a cut of scry, which corresponds to some retarded time. And you have the quantum state before and after that. And those will be entangled um, because late time radiation is entangled with early time radiation. So in, in flat space, there is a canonical way to define a page curve. So in I, I ADS, think I agree with that, but I think ADS, Subrat we have a pure state at every moment of time. <laughs> so I, Andy, I agree with that, but I think Subrat is not going to agree with that. I, yeah, so yeah, let's think, go back to Subrat. Okay, so let Sorry. me just say one thing about what Rob said. I, I think it's true, of course, if you just, if you make a division in the space by coupling the system to a bath, you will get a page curve. And that's because, you know, what you're asking is you have, you have a holographic system, you coupled it to some bath, and then you're asking a non-gravitational question about how information flows. But I think one thing that I think one should uh, appreciate is that these couplings introduce various pathologies in the model. For instance, one thing we haven't discussed is that the graviton always picks up a mass in higher dimensions. Uh -huh. So these are not really realistic models of black holes. No, going back... Sorry, can, sorry. can I just interject though? The yes, question please. I'm asking is you're saying the information is there at the boundary. By adding some extra couplings, can I extract that information into my bath or into my experimental system? Right. So I think what you did is you forgot about the constrained degrees of freedom because you switched off gravity at some interface. There's right. some, beyond some point, there's some degrees of freedom. The constraints don't apply anymore. Oh, so you threw away yeah. some information. And that's how you got a page curve because you're systematically throwing away information. That's but why but I can I extract that information was the question though. Can I, yeah, you I, probably can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Subrat, if we if we actually build a black hole and we let it evaporate and we feed the stuff that comes out into a quantum computer, what do you think we're going to see for the entropy? I, yeah, I think that's a great question. In fact, it's what you asked earlier. You know, we could have said the same thing by holography about this hard disk in front of me, right? I could say, you know, by making measurements, I could read the hard disk, but of course, that's not how I read it. And that's because in usual non-gravitational systems, there's a hierarchy of difficulty. You know, you can measure all operators, and that's something which is controlled by n Planck. And then there's the entropy of the system itself. And you know you can separate them by some significant amount. But I think the question of the small, as the small black hole example, which is absolutely right that you mentioned shows, 
In the case of gravity, you don't have this separation. The entropy is also controlled by n Planck. So you try and make quantum gravity effects very weak and the entropy goes off to infinity as well. So you, so you know, it, there's, there might be a reason that there might not be a meaningful separation between this constrained information, which takes everything outside and, you know, you somehow want to ignore some amount of information and maybe there's no meaningful separate way to do that. In it, might be a, it might be a little bit approximate, but I mean, I, I really want to pin you down if you really think if we do this and we measure, you know, we feed the, the you know, photon, they're just photons and gravitons and whatever. And well, I don't know what a beam slitter for a graviton looks like, but, you know, if we pretend that we could do that, right, and we, we, we do some you know, exponential, you know, complicated measurement, or even just the swap test, or I don't know what, you know, to compute the entropy, uh, you, you think we're not going to see it go up and you really think it's- Yeah, I think I'm happy to be pinned down. I think if you measure yeah. all components of the metric, like you, me you measure the Riemann tensor and extract, then I think you will not see it go up. And, you know, at the level where you start seeing, you know, you have enough accuracy to start seeing the page curve go down, which is e to the minus s, I think you'll find that you always have the information. Not that you don't have the information for some time that you started having it after some I have a, sorry, I have a suggestion just so that we don't stay within the same topic forever. I think that uh, it would be nice to hear from Nicholas and Henry because they did not participate I, yet in this discussion. Yeah, I was going to hand it to Henry. He's made a special effort yeah. to get up early for us. So yeah. <laughs> why don't we okay, let So him. let's go to Henry and then Nicholas. I think Samir and Nick have had their hands up for longer and and I think I'm, I'd, be, I'd be very happy to follow them. Go ahead, Henry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to um, say that I think we're uh, confusing things uh, by trying to impose our desires on uh, on the sort of new calculations of the page curve of and everything we learn about ADS CFT and so forth is obviously extremely useful. But I think that we're trying to. Uh, sort of fit the, the new page curve calculations into that framework without just looking at what the calculations are telling us and taking them at face value. And there's a very pedestrian interpretation of all of these calculations where uh, it's a purely Lorentzian interpretation of the thing. There's no mysterious non-locality where we have to talk about the island being part of the radiation and having some non-local map between them. We have microstates already. They're just the states that we already have by throwing some matter in to create a black hole. It's just, it has some, um, the side effect of having uh, super selection sectors or ensembles and so forth. But there's a relatively pedestrian and straightforward change to our definition of the theory of gravity that is a change to what Hawking would have told us, uh, but in which information as measured by observers doing repeated experiments comes out and, and there's no extra mystery in there. There's a second question of how that's related to something like string theory and when we have a full theory of quantum gravity, which I think we can make a lot of progress on. I think there's a lot of connection between the two, but I think it's important to say, first of all, and I'd be interested to see if people um, accept this, that if you just take the gravitational path integral by itself without any other ingredients, there's a consistent interpretation where measurements see energy coming out but there's um, super selection sectors uh, or, or ensembles. And this is a perfectly self-consistent uh, interpretation of everything we know where there's not very much mystery left over. Uh, Henry, I, I would just, let me just ask you, I, would, I mean, wouldn't you say that this is a, still a bit of a black box that um, you just sort of issued a bunch of instructions? I mean, why, why should we be computing the entropy in this way? Why should this object give us the entropy? What, I mean, it, I, I would, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but I don't necessarily agree with the fact that there's no mystery left over. Why, why are we using the gravitational path integral? So, well, okay, so maybe this is another uh, point is that people are often saying this is um, the kind of mystery and smartness of the Euclidean gravity path integral, mm -hmm. which is certainly the way that, that it was originally thought about and written down. But I think neither of those things are necessary. It's neither Euclidean, there's a purely Lorentzian way of describing the whole thing. With, and it's a, the, the standard way you would, you would do a, a Lorentzian real-time uh, dynamics uh, with the slight modification that you're summing over metrics. And I think there's also, uh, you could describe it in canonical language as well. But, um, so I don't think either of these things are, are really necessary. And, and it's just the question of we're doing is asking, you're doing standard calculations of 
uh, expectation values of operators. Expectation values of operators provide you boundary conditions for the, the, the path integral. Or, and you, you calculate and it gives you an answer. And it, I think it gives you answers that are consistent with, with one another. So the page curve calculations are computing what is the expectation value of a swap operator acting on many black holes. And I think all the answers you get so far seem to be consistent, if you take that point of view seriously. Um, Tom was waving his hand. Tom, do you want to? Yeah, I want to respond to that comment. I, I think I disagree with this picture. Um, I don't think there's a controlled calculation that suggests super selection sectors in a theory coupled to matter. It, there, there may be an S in, in JT gravity in two dimensions with no matter. But beyond that example, I don't think there's a really a controlled calculation like this. And a related fact is, is that I don't, I don't think you can think of the microstates as the incoming, as, as the different states of the incoming matter. I, I think people have, people tried for a long time to, to understand the microstates that way and it, and it never really worked. Um, so I, I, think I, I think I disagree there. The, the um, I think part, part of what's, Part of what we have to be really careful about is, is always saying with every calculation, always saying in what regime we, we think that it's valid. And, that, and, and part of maybe part of what Hawking did wrong was presumably not, not making that distinction. Um, I, I think I won't disagree that there's, there's a, a really sharp, well-controlled example where say we have a factorization problem in four-dimensional Einstein gravity. I think mm. that the double cone comes close, but um, uh, but I think maybe I'm saying something slightly weaker is that if you, that all the calculations that we do have, including that of a page curve, are all, there, there is a sensible, consistent interpretation that doesn't involve any, uh, any sort of extra non-locality and so forth. Um, and then the second point about, uh, counting about using the black holes formed from collapses microstates. Okay, so these are not energy eigenstates. They're not microstates in that sense, but they populate the Hilbert space. And of course, the very, very old idea is that these populate the Hilbert space, but they over count. And that's, you know, of course, you have a very large interior, you can populate it with many, many modes, but these things should not all be linearly independent. And Islands, roughly speaking, gives you a way to, to account for that overcounting, and we certainly don't understand all the details, but I think there's at least, I think there's a self-consistent picture there, and with some work to understand that, I think we could, I think that's, um, the, 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 the counting works, that the, 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 uh, the equivalences you get between states by including islands in computing in a product between these different states is enough to account for the proper counting. Uh, I, uh, I see that Daniel is waving, but I really think it would be nice to also give. Uh, yeah, I was going to yeah, turn we it. Go, yeah, we should go to. Uh, I think it would be nice to have Nicholas. Uh... Nick, okay. go for it. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I understand that the island, island prescription doesn't give a mechanism. That I understand. And as Nato nicely summarized, it doesn't. But one thing you should be able to answer, which I'd like a straight answer to, is the, in the process by which the information gets out of the black hole. Um, is it non-local in, in the radical sense? Now, there's a lot of imprecision in the language of non-local. There's non-local of entangled pairs. That's just, that's, that's standard non-radical stuff. The radical non-locality is when you actually have a non-local Hamiltonian. And I believe that the information, if you're going to argue that it gets out from the in this island paradigm, it has to involve a non-local Hamiltonian if you assume there's a smooth horizon. So the question is, is does it involve radical non-locality in the sense of a, a non-local Hamiltonian evolution? And if you say no, how do you get around the small corrections theorem um, uh, if you in, also insist on a smooth horizon? So Tom, uh, Tom is waving, yeah? Oh, very cool. I just, I just <laughs> want to ask a question before we get into that discussion, a question for you, which is how, how do you even define local or non-local in a non-perturbative theory of quantum gravity? How, how can we ask if the exact theory is local? What does that question even mean? 
well, I can go to a big astrophysical black hole and I can take my meters a large distance away and ask whether there are non-local correlations between this. I mean, you know, I, by hiding behind the screen of a, a quantum theory of gravity, you're neglecting the fact that macro, you can make macroscopic black holes and you can measure stuff. But, but if, that's your, if, if that's your definition of, of local, why do, you, why do you expect it to be local? Wouldn't the non-perturbative theory have, have non-perturbatively small commutators at, at, at uh, space-like yeah. separation? Yeah, but I think that kind of thing is covered by, by the small corrections theorem. I just want to know how the information that fell into the black hole gets out if it's not by some non-local Hamiltonian evolution. I think that's a relatively clear question. You have some, some information that's separated by megaparsecs. How does it get across megaparsecs? I think it's a reasonable question. I think it's a well-defined uh, question. Ed, Ed is yeah. Well, I think we could try to answer the next question as follows. Uh, even before the page time, the state of the outgoing radiation was extremely complex, but it doesn't contain any information about the black hole. Um, after this page time, the state is also extremely complex, but it has a simple description if, uh, as of a bipartite state, including the island. But the island, including the island is a way to give a simple description, but you could simply say that you have the state of the radiation, which... Yeah, but that radiation halfway through that, halfway through the page time, that radiation is, you know, far across the universe. There's no and so, so for that state to evolve into this marvelous simpler state, I assume requires some kind of biolocal Hamiltonian. There's nothing funny that no. happens to the evolution of the radiation state when you cross the page time. The only thing which is funny is more a mathematical fact than a physical fact. That has elucidated, as explained to us by Page, a state of more than half um, contains information when it didn't contain information with less than half. I'm not sure I understand the comment. So at, at this point, I, 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 we asked someone. No, I, we asked someone else to pair a slide. So I'm going to pitch to Dominic. Man, um, I just want to say one more sentence. Here we go. Nothing. Sure, do I believe the answer to Nick's question is that nothing special happens that has to be explained by a local or non-local Hamiltonian. But it, it, sorry. Is it not true if you choose a global, global slice, you have to have some crazy non-locality, right? Because you, have, you still have foreign object and, and the radiation. It's clear that you have to. Hey, Dominic. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thanks. So, I don't know if this is a good way of like going on to talking about demotography, but it also kind of touches on stuff that's been discussed now. So yeah, maybe let me just make a hopefully somewhat controversial statement uh, to some people, uh, namely that double holography, which is really like a, I would say the, the only really good model we have for higher dimensional uh, quantum gravity, including islands, um, the double holography suggests that in the semi-classical approximation, information about the interior of the black hole is is really not accessible from the radiation, but that there's a quantum gravitational, say, reorganization of the degrees of freedom where it is. So we, we really have a duality. So let me try to give you the basic idea. Um, if we consider like a standard doubly holographic setup, so we take vacuum ADS, look at it from um, like Rindler coordinates, we introduce an end of the world brain, which cuts off uh, part of the asymptotic boundary. Then a double holography, uh, we can either describe the system in what's called the boundary perspective here on the left, um, where it's dual to BCFTs, which live on the asthmatic boundary and the thermophile double. Um, and let's think of this as sort of quantum gravity. Um, or in double holography, this double, we can take the brain perspective. Um, namely, we say that the dual theory lives on the asymptotic boundary union, the brain. And that's sort of like displayed here on the right. And this really plays the role of semi-classical gravity. And it does so because the brain, so the green line here, um, is a dynamical space and with gravity, which contains in that particular case, an eternal black hole, which at least naively suffers an information paradox. So um, the argument we do to produce a unitary page curve is the following. We consider the region A, um, say on the left, and we compute its phenomenon entropy um, using the RT formula. Now, initially it crosses the horizon in the bulk and it grows, but after the page time, the correct RT surface connects to the brain and it's also shown on the left. 
And that makes the entropy growth stop. And as a result, we uh, get a page curve. The, the point is that this computation is really done in the boundary perspective, in the left description, and not done in the right description, this brain perspective. But this is where we have the information paradox. Um, and the point is, or the point I want to make is that one can argue in details for those who are interested on the reference down on the slide, um, that on the right hand side, we really shouldn't allow the RT surface to just randomly end on the brain, but we should use the usual homology constraint um, where we sort of need to pick boundary regions and uh, we just treat the brain as the usual asymptotic boundary. Now, if we do this, what's the resulting picture? Um, it is that the Neumann entropies of the regions A in the boundary and the brain perspective, uh, they are different after the page time at least. So in the brain perspective, the von Neumann entropy just of region A, so just of the radiation, um, even computed using RT just grows without bound. And that's just like you would naively uh, see in semi-classical gravity. And that's possible because the brain perspective is a particular reorganization um, of degrees of freedom in the boundary perspective. And we can in fact study this reorganization uh, using double holography really nicely because both descriptions share the bulk. And so the, the particular point here I wanna make is that in the brain perspective, the entanglement wedge of ACE on the right really never comes close to the brain after, even after the page time. And so in other words, on the right, um, the region A cannot be used to reconstruct the island or like whole interior or what have you. This is really only possible in a sort of quantum gravitational formulation um, like the brain perspective on the left, which doesn't have like an obvious black hole interior. Um, okay, uh, there were my comments, so I hope they spark some thoughts or comments or other ideas of what one can do with um, double holography. Yes, in your... I, yeah, I, I like this very much, by the way. Uh, I, I think this is quite uh, beautiful, congratulations. And, but uh, my question is that uh, this picture seems to be quite, so what's the point of a double holography? I think the key is what I've been saying is that essentially BCFT, that's the exterior view, like a stretched horizon is just the end point. And then you have a brain that's the interior. Yeah? So uh, this, this brain picture is interior. So essentially this BCFT versus this uh, uh, like uh, boundary being becoming brain gravitational gravitating brain, that's the interior of the black hole. That's, I think, a model of exterior view versus importing view. So of course, double holography helps in a sense of calculating using Ryu Takayanagi and so on, but that's a secondary to be, uh, 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 in, in some sense, it's a technical, it's beautiful, but uh, essence is this first duality. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, no, no, I, I agree with it, but I think that double holography adds something very important there. Of course. Um, namely, that we can now study this, right? Exactly. So, that, that's what um, I, yes. I, I didn't have time to comment on this, but for example, if, if you, you know, if you look at the paper or mm -hmm. if you remember the slides, mm -hmm. uh, and if you sort of combine, well, if you read the paper, you'll see there's like actually a really nice connection with what Neda said. What, you know, you can see all your extremal surfaces, you can see the outermost extremal surfaces, which sort of tells you which operators are going to be simple, which are going to be complex. And um, you can A, study how operators inside or outside um, the black hole are related in those two perspectives. And for example, in particular, um, you can argue that the, the, the semi-classical perspective is a reorganization of quantum gravitational degrees of freedom, but it really looks like coarse graining, at least outside the black hole. Exactly. Uh, by, by, my claim is that the, uh, in your double holography case, you can use a holography language to do this. That's great. But I'm claiming that you can, uh, you can do even without using holography language. If you carefully look at uh, like hard energy mode and a soft mode, which is related with the soft air of Landy, and then you just uh, assume the chaotic dynamics plus low energy universality. And then you know that the, all the coefficient if you expand in a basis state is just the Gaussian distributed. That's enough to extract exactly mm -hmm. the same physical information. But, but you know, the language of the holography is quite beautiful, of course. Let but, me say something, uh, Biff, Biz. No, I, I, many people, actually, uh, I want to, sorry. Rob, I, was I, good. I would Samir. ask your yeah. intelligence and yeah, we'll let Samir talk and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Is that okay, Pedro? I was precisely going to say that uh, people don't have to worry because we don't need to wrap up because we are oh, going very well, okay. so we can continue. I was precisely going to say that we can well, okay, so, and, uh, go on a little bit longer. 
But, sure. Okay. Uh, Samir, why don't you, uh, you've been waiting patiently. You've even turned your camera on now. I'm, okay. I'm sure you're. <laughs> Samir, go for it. Oh, you're still on mute. Oh, there you are. There we go. Yeah, th thanks for uh, letting me talk here. Uh, I just want to continue on with the point that Nick was making, which I think is really crucial here. I have actually been reading a lot of these papers over the past one and a half years. And I just want to emphasize once again very strongly, in none of them does the page curve actually come down unless either explicitly or implicitly you assume that there is non-local physics, which right now we have not seen directly in string theory. And I have seen three kinds of non-local physics being assumed. And I just want people to comment on that uh, after I state them that that's what they actually want. Either it could be something like baby universes disconnect and then they can reconnect somewhere else, okay? Or they can have like a non-local identification of bits, like bits at infinity are not distinct from bits in the black hole like uh, Papadodemus Raju, or they can be actual Hamilton interactions. If you flip a spin at infinity, you can flip a spin inside the black hole and extract information like sometimes Huan says how you can extract things from uh, inside a black hole. If you do not actually have any of this, but just like, I'm talking about the exact theory here. Okay, you can make some approximation. I'm talking the exact theory. If you have none of these, which you explicitly introduce in your exact theory, uh, the page curve is not coming down in any of these papers. Okay, so I just wanted to emphasize that I want to get some reactions. And that's what the small correction theorem tells you, as Nick was saying, if you assume a smooth horizon, the page curve is not going to come down as smooth horizon to any approximation in the semi-classical way. Page curve will not come down, but then these non-local things can do anything. and they they can bring it down. So Daniel was also talking about non-local things one of these uh, the day before yesterday. And I would like to know what kind of non-local things do people have in mind? That uh, what kind of interaction do they think they have postulating in gravity, which would not be part of our normal way of thinking if we just assume that something is happening in the black hole, but once particles leave, they're just like ordinary flat space quantum field theory. What other kinds of non-local things do people have in mind? Because without that, the page curve is not coming down. That, that was my question. Eva, why don't you... Oh. So sorry, sorry, Rob. I, well, Eva was waving. I, I also saw Suvrat, uh, That's but Eva, exactly what, what I was trying to suggest, yeah. Okay, yeah. I hadn't intended to participate in any debates today, but let me just uh, say one piece yeah. of, um, just a factual input, which may or may not, you know, how far this goes is uh, up to discussion. Um, there are non-localities in strength there. They're causal. They're, you know, consistent with the usual I epsilon. Um, these are the things anticipated by Susskind years ago, and they are strongest in the longitudinal direction uh, defined by the direction of relative motion of, uh, say, a detector of, a, of an early infaller in the black hole. And the scale of that um, along the, uh, let's call it the X plus direction up the, up the horizon is uh, delta X plus is P plus of the detector uh, in the local Lorentz frame divided by um, p, p squared plus f squared of, of the detector. Um, so this is just a, you know, this this is this was a prediction of Susskind's light cone gauge calculations, and we bothered to check it in the in the um, S matrix uh, with long calculations. So um, it does lead to some information uh, recovery up the horizon, which is perfectly causal. Um, how far that goes, I don't know, but extended objects are a key part of all our higher dimensional theories of quantum gravity, at least in the limits of string theory that we know. And in the context of singularity resolution, there are cases where extended objects matter. They enter before Planckian effects. And when they do, they have to be, they have to be incorporated first. So, um, you know, Samir, it's not correct to say there's no calculations involving um, non-local effects. Um, I'm certainly not claiming victory on this whole problem, but I think that one should do due diligence with these things um, and incorporate them, uh, incorporate the effects in the order that they appear. Eva, I'm totally with you that there can be very much brain or string effects in the region where the black hole is. I was talking about the fact that these papers which claim to bring the page curve down, they need non-local effects across arbitrarily long distances from the black hole to where the radiation is. Anything you do inside the region 2M, 4M is not going to bring the page curve down by these methods. For that, you need the fuzz ball when the horizon is gone, no semi-classical approximation. Right? Uh, okay, again, I'll so just say in the, in the, in the, Hayden, in the Hayden Preskill 
thing where you send something in, you ask, can you get the information out of that thing you sent in? The answer was, at least in part, yes, there is information available from this longitudinal effect. I'm not making any claims that that solves the whole problem, um, but I think you know it's a very concrete thing. So I just wanted to enter it into the discussion, uh, again, making no, no stronger claims than that. Sorry, that, sorry to interrupt you, uh, Samir, but that's, I think these are facts, so I'm just gonna stop there. Sufra, you were waving your hand. Sufra? Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Samir, I think there's a much simpler explanation for this. And Giddings and Donnelly have already computed in perturbation theory and gravity, these commutators at space like separation. And they just have to do with the fact that, you know, if you insert energy at one point, you have to modify the metric far away. And that's a commutator that's suppressed by L Planck over the distance scale. And that's just there. It's there as part of semi classical gravity. So it's certainly there as part of string theory. And one may not like it, but it's there. Uh, this is not the kind of thing that's easy to see in the S matrix because, you know, this is the, the degree of freedom that's constrained. So it's not a dynamical degree of freedom of the graviton. Uh, but it is uh, precisely the kind of non locality you need for information to get out. And, uh, you know, so gravity that way is just different from local quantum field theories. And as Daniel said, that's what we see also in holography. And, you know, one can't just rule this out by fiat. And if one doesn't, then, you know, then we don't have a small corrections theorem any longer. So could I ask you, Subrat, I didn't want to rule that out, but I, I was saying that if you have any effect that falls off a distance, it's not going to help you. So I think you were also talking about effects that don't fall off a distance in terms of your local identi non-local identification of bits. So I was trying to ask you about that. No, I think the, if the radiation that's coming out is affected by, you know, if the, the point is the description of the Hilbert space as a result of, you know, these effects is just not that of n qubits of which two of which have got separated. And, and you know, it, the small corrections here starts with the description of the Hilbert space and then says, you know, small corrections can't fix it. But that description is just, is just not correct. And that's because, you know, the description is in terms of some other degrees of freedom uh, where you have to have this identification. And I think these effects... You know, I don't think there's any contradiction. One can show that these effects follow from, you know, an examination of the constraints of the theory. So one doesn't even need to do some very fancy string theoretic computation. They're just there already in gravity and you can't avoid them. I, I'm actually, I, I'm actually going to go to Dominic. I think he was, uh, Dominic? Yeah. I, I, just, I just want to briefly comment on what, what Samir said, right? And just again, point out that I, th I think all this island stuff suggests that there's it's it's really like holographic duality. Like you in ADS CFT, you can write an operator on the boundary, which might be very complex, but it creates some excitation in the middle of the bulk. Although from the bulk point of view, the, the dual CFT where you apply this operator is at infinity, right? And now you could say, well, is there some non-locality going on? Is there like a Hamiltonian which connects, I don't know, the central point of ADS to the boundary. Um, but no, the story is that, that those are two complementary, like dual descriptions. And you do something to one description and in the other description, you, I don't know, apply a complex operator and in the other description, something pops up in the middle of ADS space. So um, I think- Can I yeah, ask for a clarification of that? Can, can I just ask for a clarification on that? Mm -hmm. Because people often say that ADS uh, CFT shows non-locality, so there can be non-locality elsewhere also. But it looks very different to me, and that's why I want the clarification. Mm -hmm. In ADS CFT, the CFT is local, the gravity is local. The map from one to the other appears non-local, but that makes sense because if you integrate out the radial direction, you know things look non-local. But now we are asking about non-locality in just one theory, gravity, and across arbitrary separation, something at one place and something on Mars. And I just want to know if you really mean that there is non-locality in gravity itself, something that I have not consciously incorporated by thinking about gravity and how I learned that from ADS CFT because I don't learn that from ADS CFT. So that's why I'm confused. Right, right. Let me just like very briefly say, I think that precisely those doubly holographic models precisely show this. Um, and, and they're sort of like helpful in the way that you have, the only thing you really need is standard ADS CFT duality um, with a bit of brains. Um, and this, this non-locality sort of in the, what do you say, like one theory. So it's say like a D-dimensional theory, um, you can just understand a sort of the usual story in the D plus one dimension in the bulk. So you apology- You don't need double holography, right? Again, sorry. No, it, it, it just a, it's just a tool, right? Just an, yeah. uh, yes. Pedagogical I tool. I just wanted to make sure that double holography is not the crucial part. So I'm gonna to apologize to Nick and, and Daniel that I'm gonna put you on hold for a second. 
because we had a uh, and uh, well to to close the discussion. This is in the end, but we had a poll, and I'm not sure if Pedro or Ned is in control of that. I'll, but I'll I'm gonna it. okay. Do, but I do I do want to say we have a few minutes after that, so we will get to oh, uh, yeah yeah. Daniel, I think yeah. All right. Please vote. Well, yeah, I hope you're all seeing this poll. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to do a quick summary, see where the uh, audience is. What, I, what, I, is I don't know. It's not an allowed no, it's not, it's not an option on purpose. <laughs> you got to commit to something. Your Bayesian prior, is it greater or less than 50%? Yeah. Does, does two require that we actually acknowledge a firewall makes any sense whatsoever? You're welcome to that. Uh, you mean the bull vacuum? That one now. <laughs> the bull vacuum, perhaps. It would have been nice if maybe was a possible answer to some of these questions. <laughs> or no, I mean, everyone will pick maybe. That's no fun. <laughs> it feels very wait, okay. Wait. It was considered, but uh... I really object to this. What? Just <laughs> forcing us to, uh, you know, it's like, go on, Andy, stake out territory. It doesn't have to stop. Well, I fast. want to stake out territory, but my territory is not an option. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I have that one too. <laughs> well, such a <laughs> so just, just annoy other people with your responses then. We're still gaining a lot of, uh, a lot of responses. Um, but I, I, I Rob, I just want to make a quick comment. I still don't okay. think I have had a response to my a real response to my question. Ed told me something which is interesting, but it doesn't think, tell me whether that state is reached by a non-local interaction. So I'd like to actually know whether this recovery of information involves non-local <laughs> interactions in these formalisms. That's I don't want to answer that question. Okay. I think it's also Samir's question. Oh. I couldn't tell if Nick was asking me for my opinion, but- no, I, Edward, I, why don't you go ahead? Well, I wanted well, to follow up. I wanted to follow up because uh, you described think, a state of affairs, I think which the I want to know is, how it got that way. I think the answer is that there's absolutely nothing that happens to the state when you cross the page time. The island story is a convenient, is a convenient way to or, give a simpler description of the complex state of the radiation. But the state of the radiation has not changed in any fashion when you cross the page time. Uh, it was a very complex state of many quanta. After the page time, it's a very complex state of slightly more quanta. The only difference is that after the page time and not before, as shown by page, it contains information about the initial state from which the black hole formed. Okay, how does that differ from the discussion of a piece of coal, which is you know, halfway but through the burning process, information starts to come out. We, we know from yeah. local, local quantum quanta quanta field that we know from local calculations in quantum field theory around a black hole, that it's not a piece of coal unless you believe the fuzzball program. Well, there's only one difference from the piece of call, which is that for the piece of call after the page time, there isn't a simple semi-classical formula for description of the state. So the island formula is a simplification that's absent. Uh, fair, fair enough, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's right or, or, or an advantage. Well, I think the only place that non-locality arises is that if you try to make an extremely complex measurement of the outgoing state, which is necessary in order to test experimentally some of these claims. A sufficiently complex measurement, then you can't ignore the fact that a sufficiently complex measurement has a non-classical effect on the geometry. But that wasn't part of the question you asked. The question well, you okay. asked was, well, let, me just, okay. please, let me finish the sentence. Sure. The question you asked was, what, hap what happens to the state when we cross the page time? And the answer to that question is nothing. No, no. My question I asked was, is there intrinsic strong non-locality of a Hamiltonian form in the way in which information gets out of the black hole using in this island scenario? The answer, that I believe, was my question. I believe the answer is no. Where there Okay, be, then how do you get, a, so the follow-up then is if you said the answer is no, how do you get around the small corrections theorem? Well, it's going to be hard to give a complete answer in the available time, but I think where there's where a paradox with locality actually arises is when we try to think through what's involved in the experiment that would test some of these claims, showing that the state of the radiation is not thermal by an extraordinarily complex measurement. 
I think we have to do accept the, the fact that if we make this extraordinarily complex measurement, the measurement will change the semi-classical picture of the geometry. I believe that's the only point at which something funny is going to happen. So to recapitulate my answer to your question, the answer to the question of what happens, what was the interaction that occurred when we crossed the page time is that absolutely nothing happens. That, that wasn't actually my question. My question was about the non locality or intrinsic non locality needed to get the information out and the presumption that often goes into these discussions yeah. that this is a smooth horizon. Where the locality were, non locality would was is when we try to carry out in practice the operation involved in proving that the outgoing state contains the information. That involves an extremely complex measurement, which probably changes the space time geometry. So is the word here extremely complex code for an extremely small, corre a small correction to the state of, away from thermal, or is it something else? So can I, can I say something? Can I, 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 I think, uh, I think Samantha's waving his hand. Uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, so, uh, I don't know. Uh, can I answer yes, the next go. question? I think, yeah. I, I, think uh, I would suggest that at this moment oh, no. we... Uh, I think we should uh, thank Rob and Neta. We can continue, but we need to test the shared screen. So uh, 